Hi, everybody. It's working. You guys are good? Well, this week's been fun, huh? A lot going on. Um, so quickly, let, let me sort of uh, walk through, I think, how I want to handle this today. So first things first, I, I think what I'll do is I'll sort of lead with an introductory sort of statement of sort of what's gone on and where we're at at this point in time and why we're all here today. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of turn it over to Jeff and I'll let Jeff sort of get through the next steps of where we're going. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware, in the last 24, 48 hours, you saw us put out a statement. I think disappointingly they used Conor McGregor as a vehicle to sort of try to articulate and reframe a complete misrepresentation of what occurred over the last several months. And, you know, behind the scenes, I've talked to some of you in here about the direction Jeff and I were looking to sort of take this. Um, but what I can categorically tell you is what USADA has put out in the last 48 hours could not be, uh, it couldn't be farther from the truth. So with, with that all being said, let, let me sort of walk you through where we're at. Um, you know, eight years ago when Jeff came over and worked with Dana and Lorenzo and Lawrence and the whole team here to build out this program, there wasn't a mechanism to do this in any other way other than using USADA. And frankly, for the last, I would say, first six years of the program, USADA was an incredible partner. Um, I, I know that we built out the single greatest testing program in all of professional sports. And I couldn't be prouder, and I know Jeff couldn't be prouder of the program that was built out. In the last several years, and I know a lot of you that have been a part of this and have followed it have seen it, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of technological change that's occurred. And not only has there been a massive amount of change, there's also been a fundamental changes in the science that's gone into it, as well as the players in the space. And so you have a majority of the professional sports that all have anti-doping programs now. Uh, a lot of them, from what I understand, were also built off of what Jeff and Dana and Lorenzo and everybody built when we built this program to begin with. When I came over uh, at the beginning of 16, um, you know, we've continued to make changes. I know that you guys are probably aware we were the entity that pushed for changes with thresholds and contaminated supplements. They fought us on that a majority of the time, and now they've taken the position that this is sort of the standard that they're pushing for globally at the WADA level. Um, and, and I could list a million others, and I'll let Jeff sort of get into those details. But I, I think what's important is I'm going to give you guys a legal letter today. I think Lene and the team sort of have it printed out that was sent to USADA last night. The, 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 the core focus of the letter is as I've just explained to you, the material misrepresentations that I believe were, were made on behalf of USADA and Travis. That being said, what I don't want to do today is I'm not going to do what I feel like he's done for the last 24, 48 hours. Uh, Jeff and I have always approached this program and everybody involved in it with a level of class and dignity that, and frankly professionalism that I don't think has been exhibited. Um, and listen, I know Travis has a board, and I know we make up, I think, roughly 25 to 30 percent of his total budget, total revenue. And so I can tell you, I understand from a business perspective why he may be acting the way he's acting, and he's going to have to answer to a board and people. And, you know, Jeff and I were talking, you know, horse racing, who was all but encouraged strongly from Congress to get a deal done with USADA, wasn't able to do so in the last, I think, 18 months. And they went with a company called Drug Free Sport, which is an entity that we're gonna move to as well. Um, so I think there's a lot going on there. And I think that explains sort of the reaction that he's taking publicly. And I think it's a self-preservation tactic. I think it will ultimately fail, but that's for him to deal with. And I really don't wanna get into that. What I can say is I'm grateful for the work that we've done with them. I appreciate what they've done for us, and we wouldn't be able to be in the position we're at today without their help and assistance. And frankly, up until the last, I would call it two or three years, the relationship really was a productive and incredibly beneficial relationship for all parties. And I kind of want to end on that note, and whatever he's going to continue to say, he can say. I know today I was told after I think they received our letter last night, he's already backtracked, and he's now confirmed that at no point in time did Jeff myself or any other UFC representative, Dana, not a single person ever went to USADA and told them anything other than Conor McGregor would re-enter the program when he was healthy. And in doing so, we would require him to be in the program for six months. 
there would be no exception to the rule. And what I said to Travis on multiple occasions, including the call on Monday, was there would never be a situation where Connor would fight until he'd been in the program for six months. And my words were, I don't give a shit if he has 37 clean tests. This was one of those cases where Connor was the most tested athlete in the UFC before he catastrophically shattered his leg. The conversations I had with Connor and his physician when that occurred had nothing to do with fighting. They were legitimately concerned that he wasn't gonna regain full use of his leg ever again, including the ligaments around it. And I'll say it one last time, what they've done to him is disgusting. And for an entity that holds themselves out to have a level of honor and integrity, using him as a media vehicle to advance a fake narrative is disturbing, disgusting, and I think they have some legitimate legal liability that they should be very concerned with. But again, I'm gonna let it sit there. You guys have the letter. You can work through it. Jeff and I will answer questions for you after this. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to him, and this is the last point I'm gonna tell you, and this is why, you know, I, I, I don't, Dana is the greatest in the world with the media and handling all this stuff. I don't particularly care for it. But this is one of those instances that's so fundamentally important for the amount of work and time and effort that we've put in as a team to build the best program. And frankly, I will tell you that on the call on Monday that Jeff and I had with Travis, when he, when he lost his mind, and I can tell you he was incredibly disappointed that I informed him that we would not be continuing the partnership at the end of the year. So this wasn't a situation where he came to us and said, this is untenable and we can't continue. It was, hey, great to talk to you, you know, looking forward to the future. And I said, look, as I've given you every indication over the last few months, I've been exploring different alternatives and I'm going in a different direction. And what he basically said is when he, when he found out, he went crazy. He started saying a bunch of crazy things. And he ultimately made a comment to the effect of, you and Jeff are gonna go out there and you're gonna tell people that you can run a better program and that we are no longer the gold standard. And I replied, that's exactly what's gonna happen because that's the truth. Um, and I'm sorry that you know he didn't like that answer, but that's the reality. So uh, my greatest frustration in the last 48 hours has been the damage that he's tried to do to the program as a whole. We've had massive confusion with the athletes. I can't tell you how many athletes, managers, media have reached out saying, so you're no longer in drug testing, this program's ending. Can I tell USADA that they don't have to test me anymore? And the answer is, we didn't terminate the USADA partnership. We just informed them that we wouldn't be renewing and we would be building out a new program beginning uh, at the beginning of the year. So the testing continues, everything is status quo through the end of the year until you know, something happens otherwise, I don't know, it's gonna be a complicated relationship for the next few months. Connor is 100% in the pool. He made himself available in every way. I can tell you because I personally was a part of it with him. He's conducted himself with integrity and honesty. He's done everything right. And he's, as you can imagine, very upset at the moment for the way that they've sort of used him. And they've never done that with any other athlete in history. And I think that's a really important point what they've done in the entire history of the program, they've never done before. So again, incredibly disappointing. They've done tremendous damage to try to hurt the integrity of the program we've built in a very short period of time. And again, why we're here today is to let you guys know and fill you in transparently on why the program that we're gonna be building out and integrating beginning at the beginning of next year is even better than where we're at today. And that's the reason we made the change. So, I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff to sort of get into now the technical stuff. And then once he finishes up, he and I are available for any questions you guys are gonna have, okay? Thanks, Hunter. First off, I, I just wanna echo what Hunter said by starting off is this has been an overwhelmingly successful program. I think we have transformed the sport of MMA, not just UFC, in an incredibly positive direction. We're approaching 30,000 individual tests in our program with a positivity rate of less than 1%. And that has seen the frequency, and we've seen the frequency of those positivity cases drop dramatically throughout the course of the program. But things evolve. You learn things. You learn from mistakes that have been made, and I'm not sitting up here denying that USADA has made its share of mistakes throughout this, this program. 
You identify people and entities in this space that can make something that is already working well even better. You learn that USADA is not the only player in this space and that a combination of other entities and individuals can actually make your program stronger and better. And that's exactly what's happening right now with our program. I, th I think all you guys know, I've lived in the world of anti-doping going back almost 22 years. I've learned a lot during that time, a lot. I'm never complacent when it comes to the program. And what you're seeing happening right now is putting that 22 years of knowledge, experience, those lessons to use in making what is already the best anti-doping program in all sports even better. And along those lines, I want to make this crystal clear. I will never, never be involved with a program that compromises the core values of what a gold, and let's call it a platinum standard program, looks like. I've staked my career, my reputation, my credibility, in some cases the safety of myself and my family, and everything that I've done as a professional on a personal level on maintaining these standards and fighting with everything I have for clean sport, and that will continue. I'm not up here today to do a tit-for-tat exchange with USADA. I'm here to give you the facts of what we're planning to do, to tell everyone what our plan is and what we're about to do. You can take what I have to say, do your own homework and research, and come up with your own conclusion of what is happening here and what we're doing. But the narrative that USADA put out yesterday is false, it's garbage, trash. I can't sit up here and come up with enough adjectives of, of what they said and what that's done to this program currently. Here's what the accurate narrative is. You guys all know this. We've talked about it, and I've got up here many times and talked about this throughout the years, but the core principles of our anti-doping program are as follows. Integrity, independence, transparency, strength and comprehensiveness, fairness, and none of these principles are changing going forward. They're only going to get stronger. So let's take a look at the facts here. First off, the athlete experience. It's no secret over the last several years that UFC athletes have complained about the technology they are given to fulfill their duties. Our athletes have a heavy, heavy burden of responsibilities put on them under the program. And you've all heard many times about the quality of technology they are given to fulfill some of those duties. Our internal UFC technology team has been hard at work been working fast and furious the last several months to give our athletes technology that makes whereabouts reporting easier, simpler, less bugs, more effective. So right off the bat, our athletes, who are obviously the most important people in the scope of this program, will see things get easier for them. Less glitches, less bugs, less ability to enter conflicting information, simplicity. The transparency of the program. You will continue to see the level of transparency that we currently have under the program. Competitors, media, public fans will be able to read word for word exactly what the rules of the program are. They will continue to see who is tested and when with even more accuracy than what's going on right now with USADA. In fact, we'll continue our testing milestone recognition program. I'll tell you, over the last 24 hours, in addition to mentioning what Hunter said, that some athletes are confused that testing isn't going on anymore, Donna Marcolini and I, my partner, have heard from many athletes asking, hey, I'm a couple tests away from my jacket. Am I still getting it? That's going to continue. We're going to continue recognizing these athletes for the burdens and responsibilities they have and what they're doing to maintain a clean sport. And you'll continue to see all the reasoning and the facts of any case that is brought against any athlete at the adjudication stage. Just like we are now, we're going to continue to be the most talked about, transparent, anti-doping program in professional sports. None of that's changing. The sample collectors. Hunter brought this up earlier. Another frontline athlete experience are the DCOs, or doping control officers, who collect biological samples from our athletes. And frankly, this one hurts a little bit. As the USADA DCOs are some of the most professional, best people I've met in my career. But again, there's always ways to get better. 
As Hunter mentioned, Drug Free Sport International is a sample collection agency. They currently handle collection duties for the following professional sports leagues. They have a 325 long-term tenured sports clients, including the NFL, NCAA, Major League Baseball, NBA, WNBA, NASCAR, Horse Racing Integrity and Welfare Unit, PGA, LPGA, FIFA, CrossFit. They actually help out with some uh, drug testing with various NADOs, National Anti-Doping Authorities throughout the world and various sports federations. They virtually collect samples for everybody. Drug Free Sport International handles the collection of biological samples from virtually every sport. In fact, we see from time to time that USADA has contracted out with Drug Free Sport to, to, and their collection network of over 5,000 strong international collectors. They actually test in over 100 countries. They collect over 200,000 samples annually. So for a sport with over 650 athletes in over 50 countries, they fit us perfectly. Easier and more efficient contact with our athletes on a global scale. I think you can see with these statistics that they have more collection experience than, than anybody in the game and really fit our model. Drug Free Sport was also the first collections agency in the world to develop a paperless reporting system, something that USADA tailed on and uses now. Let's talk about the science. Dr. Dan Eichner runs a sports medicine testing and research laboratory in Salt Lake City, Utah, also known as Smyrtle one of two United States WADA accredited anti-doping laboratories, the highest accreditation standard in anti-doping in the world. Those of you that cover and follow athletic commissions and athletic commission meetings, specifically Nevada and California, know that Dr. Eichner is the most respected scientist in this space. He will be our science advisor. He's gonna direct the program on test distribution, smarter testing planning, more efficient testing planning. He will evaluate the testing results in the program and make recommendations to our independent administrator, which I will talk about shortly. Already through conversations with Dr. Eichner, he has advised us to make the following changes, which we will, to make the program better. We're gonna increase special analysis testing from what USADA does now. This includes EPO testing, in my estimation, one of the most dangerous drugs in our sport. When we launch this program, January 1st, we will conduct EPO special analysis at the highest rate of any sport federation in the world. We will have innovative blood collection devices and move away from phlebotomy for all, drug test, for all blood testing. We'll use the leaching device called Tasso Plus, Right off the bat, we will eliminate the need for venous blood draws and phlebotomists from our athletes. And I'll tell you what, right now that comes as a relief to many of our athletes who are deathly afraid of needles and blood draws. They're gonna love this. New devices have just come online that are leaching devices that have small micro needles. They will puncture just the outer you know, capillaries under the skin to collect tubes of blood. And Dr. Eichner has informed us that everything a full venous blood draw can do can be done with this device. We will increase the amount of blood testing right off the bat under this new program. We will conduct studies on the use of stimulants out of competition. There's a lot of talk around about this being an issue in this sport, and rather than guessing or opining, we are going to find out if there's an issue. Along those lines, we're gonna have the most comprehensive prohibited list, utilizing in part what is in and out of competition programs. We will conduct, continue to conduct dry blood spot testing, um, consistent with the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NFL. We are gonna to start to conduct oral fluid testing, where we collect a small sample of oral fluid to be stored in conjunction with in-competition samples. We'll only analyze those if we have adverse findings for stimulants that can differentiate between an athlete using recently or an athlete using several days ago where they just misjudged how soon or how late to discontinue use of these substances. This is an increased level of protection for our athletes who aren't trying to cheat, but just miscalculated when to discontinue things that are allowed to use out of competition. 
We will conduct growth hormone growth hormone releasing factors, GHRFs, testing on every single sample with a plan to move this to blood if it turns out to be a better matrix according to Dr. Eichner. We're going to continue our biological passport program, including the steroid module in urine. We already have plans to expand the program through blood, specifically looking at test testosterone and luteinizing hormones. Um, this will be beneficial uh, to, to, to all of our athletes. We will increase the amount of IRMS testing, isotope ratio mass spectrometry, the most comprehensive and precise way to deter catch testosterone abuse. We will have a more robust, robust long-term storage program. We'll store a percentage of samples and reanalyze them if Intel suggests to do more special analysis on certain samples or if new technology improves in the future. So what you're gonna see is smarter, more efficient, greater use of technology, and once again, more convenience to our athletes. And that's going to be right off the bat. And this will be under the consulta consultation and direction of the top scientists in anti-doping, in my opinion, in my 22 years of experience, our science coordinator, Dr. Daniel Eichner. Go ahead. Uh, I want to jump in with this, too, because this is incredibly important. So, you know, one of the things Travis was talking about a little bit in the last 24 hours has been this concept that he believes that in some way the independence is going to change and the UFC is just going to be sitting around controlling all these things. What we've actually done is we've increased the level of independence. And the one, and this is one of the frustrations when Jeff talks about getting involved and he's about to get involved, you know, go into a little more detail about where we're headed next, but we're subject to the jurisdiction of athletic commissions. So what I'll tell you is I actually had a pretty long couple of days dealing with some Abu Dhabi stuff. Dana and I had a lot going on. I didn't even know you saw to put out a press release. And the first call that I got that informed me that something had happened was actually Andy Foster. So for those of you that are aware of the regulatory space, Andy Foster is sort of, at the time, right now, he's sort of the guy in the regulatory field that everyone sort of looks to in terms of leadership. Um, and the first thing he said to me is, Hunter, I am so glad to hear that you're, you're terminating the USADA partnership at the end of the year. You know, you guys spend so much money, you put so much work into this, you can do it so much better. As you know, I've hated working with USADA. I've never enjoyed it. I know other commissioners feel the same way. And I think it's a really important point for this, for this reason. It's impossible for us to run a program that doesn't have a level of independence and oversight because at the end of the day, we're, oh, we, we have oversight by government regulatory bodies. So whatever happens, we ultimately are in their jurisdiction as much as we're in the jurisdiction out of competition with the athletes that we're, we're overseeing independently. So, you know, the concept that this will be a program that the UFC controls and it's similar to other professional sports, it's just not true. And it's distinguished by the fact that at the end of the day, Dana is licensed, I'm licensed, we're, we as a business are licensed by these athletic commissions. We have an obligation to act with honesty and integrity and they get the results of whatever occurs. Every athlete that competes, every fight that's put together by the matchmakers, all of the things that occur, they have to approve. So there's never a situation where somebody could be out there doing something and it gets covered up. It doesn't work that way. And again, for him to insinuate anything other than that is incredibly disappointing and misleading. So I'll let Jeff go to the next step. That leads us finally, and, and probably most importantly, to who is the independent, and I stress that word, independent administrator of our program. And with that, I, I want to introduce, not in person here today, but to the UFC world, the independent administrator of the UFC's new and improved anti-doping program, George Pirro. And when you talk about George Pirro, you're talking about an individual with the highest level of integrity and credibility you can possibly imagine. And while I had a noticeable federal law enforcement career, my resume pales in comparison to that of George Pirro. And as I talk about George Pirro, he's quite literally an American hero. He just recently retired as the special agent in charge of the FBI field office in Miami, Florida. He previously was the Assistant Director of the International Operations Division at FBI Headquarters. He was the Supervisor of the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. He's also a world champion, no-gi, jiu-jitsu, master's level. Uh, he knows the sport. 
He knows what the athletes go through from his world-class level training. We actually had George out uh, at headquarters a few weeks ago, and he was mentioning to us that he's watched every single UFC pay-per-view, every single fight, virtually every one live. He knows more about this sport in the UFC than probably the entire personnel uh, of USADA does. And most significantly, when the US, United States captured Saddam Hussein, George was solely in charge of his, his interrogation. The US government literally put the safety of the citizens of the United States in his, sand, in his hands, sent him over to Iraq, and he was Saddam's only contact with the outside world for a period of about nine months. Um, George will make every, and I stress, every final decision in the program. That authority will be his and his alone. We will surround him with experts, with the likes of Dr. Eichner, so that George has every single resource out of his uh, at his disposal to make the right call every single time. And I'm sure that everybody listening to this is running to their phones and computers to look up George Pirro and who is this guy, and I would encourage you to do so. Uh, he was featured on 60 Minutes, actually a two segment, which you very ra rarely find there, on his inter interrogation of Saddam Hussein. Go watch and go see what kind of person George Pirro is and whether he would compromise the integrity of the UFC's program. Never happened. You know, what always happens in the UFC since I've been here is out of chaos, we always come out better on the other side. And I fully expect, despite this garbage narrative that's been put out this week, that this is going to happen here. And I always say with this, because we're so transparent, the proof will be in the pudding. Let's come back up here and sit here a year from now. And you can tell me if the bullshit that USADA is putting out right now is true or what I'm saying up here is true. I'll, I'll lay that on the line with anybody. And then just lastly, before I turn it back to Hunter, and, and he mentioned this early, and I really want to, to make this clear to our fighters who are watching this, because that's something that USAD has done over the last two, you know, 24 hours. They've confused the shit out of our fighters. They don't know what's going on. You know, if you take into account the managers that have contacted Don and I and the fighters, I'd, sell, I'd say well over half of our roster thinks there's currently no drug testing going on. And that's not true. And for an organization like USADA that stands up on a mountain and says, we protect the rights of clean athletes, that's what we do. They didn't do it here. They got this thing wrong for, for whatever reason, likely a lot of the ones that Hunter chronicled. And as you could probably tell, I'm not happy about it. But we're keeping our head down and we're going full steam ahead and, and watch what we do at the beginning of the year. All right, so I think it makes the most sense is to sort of open it up to questions. So who's got the first one? Hunter, you know, you, you mentioned that they've never done this statement that they did yesterday announcing Connor's back in the pool and stuff, but it feels like they've actually been fairly vocal about Connor throughout this whole process. They spoke to the media more time than I can remember of any other fighter. Why do you think they chose to do that from the beginning? It, it's, it's sort of fascinating. I, I, I think... Again, I'm, I'm trying very, very hard to take the high road. <laughs> um, here, here's what I can tell you. USADA has the ability to operate in a world where fundamentally the athletes they deal with are Olympic athletes, okay? And again, I'm gonna say this respectfully and truthfully. The amount of issues Travis and USADA deal with on a geopolitical scale are beyond the comprehension of the average person. They're dealing with water worlds and Russian doping and a million different things. For all the good they do in the US and for that program, and I think that they, they exercise their best efforts, they run a little bit like a dictatorship. And, and part of the reason why is, is that they're dealing with a body of athletes that essentially have no financial resource. If you're, listen, if you're one of the best 400 meter sprinters in the world, how much money do you think you make? You know what I mean? With us, it doesn't work that way. You don't come in and just tell us how this works. You don't tell us this is what we're doing. No, it's a conversation. And we have an ability to create dialogue and communication and work in a partnership. And 
I think that the reason they've sort of treated Connor this way is our, our, our athletes are independent contractors. And as you all know, Connor is a very wealthy, very confident, you know, interesting character. And, and Connor's not the type of guy that's going to sit around and just let people create narratives. He's going to create his own and he's going to tell you what he feels. And that's part of what makes Connor brilliant. And I think they hate that. They like being able to be the authority figure that tells you what's what. And I think Connor has done a more vocal job than most athletes would of, of getting out there and telling his followers and his community and the people that, that follow our sport what's going on with him. And I think they hate that. I really do. And, and it's one thing for them to respond to something because they feel like he's, he's saying, oh, I'm going to compete and I'm going to do this. Well, that's what Connor does. Right. But at the end of the day, like we've told them and, and as the letter addressed, you know, I got a phone call, uh, I think in August and Travis called me and I think Connor said, I'm going to fight in December. I'm ready. I'm training. And I said to Travis, I already have two title fights done. Dana's dealing with a lot of stuff right now. So he hasn't been able to get back and get in the room and walk through everything and go to announce it. And, you know, we have a whole process for how we do this. And he has to have the ability to break all this stuff, but I can give you my word, Connor's not fighting in December. Well, he's saying, he says a lot of things, okay? You guys know, Connor says a lot of shit. And he says a lot of crazy shit. But the reality is, they knew in August, and they knew again on Monday in the phone call, there was never going to be an exception made where Connor was going to fight before he was six months in the program. And like I said, I flew out to LA, Connor and I got together, we had an incredible meeting, and we actually spoke to Travis personally, the three of us. Connor, myself, and Travis. And, and it was made clear and Connor acknowledged that he would be in the program for six months. And th that's why this is so frustrating. I think they use him to answer your question. They use him the way they have because he has allowed them to get a level of media attention that they can't get on their own. You saw to put some shit out and no one cares. You connect Connor to it and all of a sudden it explodes, whether it triggers the algorithms or whatever. And, and truthfully, that's why I'm most disappointed about the way that they've handled the last 48 hours. They used an athlete as a vehicle to advance a false narrative. I think it's incredibly unethical. Incredibly. You mentioned about the emotion he displayed on the phone call when you told them that you won't be re-signing with them. If you read the letter that they or the press release they put out, you can sort of see that emotion, right? First of all, they acknowledge that you guys aren't renewing the contract, but then they say, oh, the relationship became untenable and sort of act as if they're the ones pushing you away. Correct. Do you think that sort of Bumbo Jumbo sort of shows through their emotion and how much ego is at play here? Ego, fear. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And like I said, one, one of the parts of the call that I think really bothered me a lot is I could not have been, frankly, more calm. And I couldn't, sort of as I'm speaking to you today, and, you know, I, I have my demeanor about me and I can get animated, but it doesn't happen often. The reality, though, is I, I spoke to him the way that I'm speaking to you today. And I couldn't have been more clear about the reasons we were making change. And he was just completely unhinged. Like it, it was truly, it was like a version of a mental breakdown. And the only thing that I logically can sit back as I reflect on that call and think is, this is an individual that's dealing with a lot of shit right now. And, and I think that this was a call that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back type of moment. And I can't speak for what he has going on behind the scenes, but like I said, you know, the horse racing thing was fascinating, and Jeff knows more about it than I do. But to, to make a long story short, the federal government, from what I understand, basically told the horse racing industry, we're telling you to get a deal done with USADA, and they couldn't do it. And then you get to the program where we're at, and we start walking through. And I mean, listen, as you heard Jeff sort of talk about, you can tell this wasn't something that we did reactionary and figured out in the last 48 hours. You know, they've been shooting some documentary stuff with Dana, myself, and a bunch of the UFC people. I mean, we have document, you know, we have, we have video of the meetings we've had over the last six months and how much time and work and effort was put into this. You know, I, I've said it before, Dana requires everybody who works here to have a culture of, are you doing the best? Are you creating the best program? Do we have the best production? Are these the best fights? I mean, and, and we did this in the most thoughtful, comprehensive, and frankly, intellectual way. And it was articulated to him that way. So to answer your question, I don't know what's going on with him. I don't, I wouldn't want to be him. I wouldn't want to walk into a board meeting and have to address what's going to happen now. I, I don't know what he's going to do to fulfill a 30% shortfall in his budget. 
I can't help but think we were fulfilling a lot of filling a lot of gaps that he was using for some other stuff. I mean, Jeff talked about technology. In the meeting we had, I think in May, I was more animated in that meeting because I've been told that we would have a technology solution for whereabouts for athletes going back almost two years now. Jeff has the number, but I think in 2021, I think USADA spent over a million dollars, maybe close to two million in quote, technology research. I don't have an app that the athletes can use that update their whereabouts or give them to do so right now in the day and age we live in. You can track your kids everywhere they go, okay? You can track your spouse everywhere they go. I can't track athletes. And we have guys in every country around the world. Like these are simple solutions when you're paying millions and millions and millions of dollars a year that you expect. And the answer isn't, ah, oh, we're working on it. No. You're working on it for three months, not two years. Figure it out. Yeah. So basically, I just to put your point succinctly, and this is the last one for me, this is not a case of, oh, we fell out with each other. This is a case of they basically aged out, and we have a new and better agency that will do things in a better, more modern way. Yes, I think that's probably very accurate. I'll just go back real quick to that technology, and it actually predates our, our complaints and trying to get them to fix this to put maybe the most important things that our athletes have in their hands predates the last contract renewal. That was four years ago. And we have been continually promised, oh, it'll be in your hands, you'll get to see it soon. As I sit here now, I haven't seen jack shit from their new technology. And Hunter's right. Go back and look at USADA's 990s, which they're required to file, financial statements, being a 501c3 corporation. You can look and you can see that breakdown of how much money the UFC program contributes to their revenue, the amount of money they spent on technology, and the one I looked at today was 1.8 million. For what? For, for apps and technology that doesn't work, makes things confusing. I mean, the amount of calls Don and I get from our athletes with athletes having whereabouts reporting issues are fucking ridiculous. It's not that difficult. And these athletes deserve something to be put in their hands that works, that can lessen that, that tremendous burden that they have. Yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you this too. It was tremendously frustrating at parts of the call on Monday. And I heard him, I think Lene or someone shared with me something that he said today, talking about the UFC's revenues, right? How much money we make should not be his concern. His concern should be delivering for us the greatest program that can possibly be delivered. And I think it's incredibly frustrating as well for him to try to create this narrative that in some way this was about money and it, and it really wasn't about money. It was about using the millions and millions and millions of dollars that we've spent and continue to spend every year and how it's being used effectively to build the best program. And, and the short answer is nothing I've seen in the last three years indicates that they're on a path to do that. So when you spend you know, multiple months dealing with other people in the industry and you start recognizing, hmm, maybe there's a reason why every other major professional sport has gone with drug free sport and gone a different route. Maybe there's a reason why, let's figure it out. Let's sit with them, let's give them an opportunity. It became very clear, I think, why that is the case. You know, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't listen. I don't know where USADA goes from here with the professional sports industry, and God only knows what Travis is going to do after this press conference with what he's going to try to manufacture or come up with or whatever. But, but I'll also tell you this: I do think at his core, Travis is a good person. I think his career suggests he has a high level of integrity. Again, I think this is uncharacteristic for him, based on what I've dealt with over over the last number of years. I'll also tell you this part though that was frustrating and articulated in that May meeting. When you build out an organization, and you see it here, when we built an anti-doping program, Dana Lorenzo, they went out there and got Jeff Nowitzki. When we're looking at building out an anti-doping program, I went to Jeff and I said, this would kill me. You might be the best individual in the world to run an anti-doping program on your own. No one has a higher level of credibility. No one knows the sport better. It would fucking kill me to lose you because I know the trust and the respect you have you might be the best guy. He called me back the next day and said, I'm so flattered, I'm honored, but I love being a part of this company. I love Dana, I love you, I love Everett Fighters. There's one guy that if I was building the program, I would hire first, and that was George. 
So, you know, you start working through this thing and you talk about executive leadership and what it means to be the CEO of a company. Part of being a CEO, in my opinion, is building the leadership team around you of people that reflect your values. So Travis can talk about the values all he wants. I, I, I beg you to reach out to the athletic commissions and ask them their experiences with the leadership team that he's built over the years. And I'm not getting into it because they were confidential, but if you had sat through the arbitrations I've sat through with some of the athletes, I had one, and I'll tell you this is a true story. I called Dana and I called Jeff the same day. And I said, I honestly can't fucking believe what they have just done over the course of six hours. The amount of time and money and effort that has been spent to get here with what I saw presented, it, I, I literally walked out of the room and said, I feel sick. This is disgusting and it's unethical and it's wrong. Now, Travis wasn't a part of that, but the people he employed were. And those people are gone now, so you know it's what it is. But it's just, this is what I'm saying. This isn't something, and again, this is my frustration. This has nothing to do with Conor McGregor or testing or whatever. And, and by the way, why in the hell would Conor McGregor re-enter a testing pool? And then they claim that the reason that partnership is ending is as a result of him or some request on, it, it literally makes no sense. It would have been easier just to say, Conor's not going in and your, your contract's terminated, we'll see you later. Why would, why, would, why would he do that? Why would we do that? Again, if you think about the timeline, none of what they're saying makes sense. So, Jeff, uh, if I could ask you a, a couple questions. First of all, if you could equate George's position, it, would, would George sort of be like what Travis is to this program right now? Is that how, kind of how he would be? Absolutely. He'll be the final authority. And again, while we're going to give him the science resources, the legal resources, UFC resources, George will be tasked with solely making the final decisions in this program, whether it's missed test decisions, whereabouts failure, positive test cases, whatever it may be, that's gonna be in George's hands, George's hands only. Um, it'll have nothing, the UFC will have nothing to do with those decisions. So as Hunter just talked about the arbitration process then, so you saw that if they had a dispute with an athlete, they would take it to arbitration. Is George going to do that same thing if there's that dispute, or will George himself rule on the cases? So, yeah, I'll handle that Go one. Ahead. So, so it, it's a four-party process, but ultimately what will happen is this. George serves as the adjudicative body that an athlete would go to. So in a hypothetical scenario, let's say an athlete gets a test result. It goes, Drug Free Sport collects it. They send the sample directly to the Smyrtle lab. Eichner and his team at Smyrtle analyze it. They report the finding directly to George. It comes back adverse. George makes the determination that the adverse finding was an intentional use, that the athlete intended to cheat. He says to the athlete, here's the sanction. Just like you saw it would in an adjudicative process. The athlete says, that's not true. That's not what happened. I'm not taking a sanction for what I didn't do, X, Y, and Z. The final sort of tier is an arbitration process. And we've had that in place with USADA as well. The arbitration process would involve the athlete essentially filing with a company called McLaren. They've been an incredible partner. That's not changing for us. I can't speak, I, I literally can't speak highly enough of the integrity that they've approached the program with. Um, so all of that still remains in effect. And like what Jeff said earlier, I mean, part of my frustration, again, with Travis's comments earlier is, I find it incredibly ironic and also humorous that he makes this representation that there's some fundamental massive step back, but essentially every party that we're contracting with independently are also parties that they've used. So what's your issue with us independently contracting with the parties that you've had a lot of faith and trust in, so much so that you've used them? I'd love for you to answer that question for me. And he wasn't able to do so. And he makes that opinion and he puts out that statement without a clue of what we're doing. When Hunter's referring to the call on Monday, none of this was discussed. They don't know the work that we put in. They don't know these different individuals and entities that we're going to. He has no idea. So the irresponsibleness of putting out a statement like that, having no idea of what direction that we're going to alone speaks volumes of the crap that that statement was and the narrative that's been played these last 24 hours. And, and to be clear, just so you guys know as well, my call to them on Monday also included about a 10 minute conversation where I said to Travis, again, grateful for the partnership. We're not here where we're at without you. 
This isn't about animosity. This isn't about termination. And I will do whatever it takes to work with you and your team on a communications plan where I can articulate our appreciation and gratitude for the position we're in today. And we wouldn't be there without you. And I couldn't get a word in. I, he literally was completely unhinged. Uh, it was very strange. And, and again, this could have been handled so much better with a better level of professionalism and dignity. And again, I'm just, I'm just disappointed. And I don't hold it against him, like I said. I know he's got a lot going on, and I feel bad for whatever he's going to have to deal with. But the way that he's handled everything in the last two days, that's the reason I'm here and we're here doing this today. And Jeff, I know in the times I've talked to you over the eight years you've been with this UFC, ethics has been a, a big issue with you. Is there any conflict at all with Dr. Eichner in terms of the state athletic commissions are using his lab to you know, do some of the examination? Or like say the Nevada Athletic Commission would test a fighter and then uh, your program would test the same fighter. Is there any kind of conflict or any safeguards to make sure that there's you know, any no issues there? Yeah, we're you know currently really careful about that, and we continue to maintain that that carefulness. So you know, for instance, in Nevada, when we come into Nevada, currently USADA communicates with the Nevada Commission and says, "Who are you guys testing? We'll test the rest." You're correct, Kevin. You don't want dual samples taken at the same time, sent to even the same laboratories, yet alone different laboratories. So we'll still maintain that standards. That'll be George's position. Two. Um, you know, to communicate, to lobby, to develop rapport with the commissions. And frankly, as Hunter mentioned earlier, I mean, that was at the top of the list weakness. I mean, you guys know this better than me, but how do the athletic commissions feel, Nevada, Andy Foster, about USADA? You probably talk to them more about this than I do. It's not good. George is going to improve that dramatically immediately. I know he will. And then one thing, from a question about the, from the athlete's perspective, I've seen a lot of the athletes on Twitter complain about I'm getting awakened at 6 in the morning or 5 in the morning. And So is there anything that you can do to improve that type of thing for the fighters? That's a great point, Kevin. George is not going to be waking up fighters in the middle of the night that have two hours left of sleep before a championship match like what happened at Volkanovski in Abu Dhabi. George is not going to be attempting to collect urine samples like USADA did from Paulo Costa at 6 a.m. in Salt Lake City as he's wrapped under blankets trying to lose the last couple pounds and probably hasn't ingested any fluid for, you know, 12, 18 hours. Um, George isn't going to make testing decisions like we've seen of athletes who have lost a fight, retired in the octagon, have been tested pre-bout, and then wanted to be tested, blood tested post bout after they've announced their retirement. So just common, you would think, knowing the sport, common sense, very basic decisions that, you know, it seems like time after time we've seen, George has too much knowledge and respect of this sport to be making decisions like that. And he'll be an immediate improvement right off the bat in terms of someone who's intimately familiar with what these athletes are doing and going through. And then my last question for you guys is, uh, you referenced Connor was going to stay in the program for six months, and there is a rule about getting an exemption that, like, Brock Lesnar got that thing. Um, how do you tweak that at all, and how do, how do you approach each individual case if a situation comes up that a fighter applies for an exemption to not have to be in the pool for six months? That, you know, what's fascinating, and I'll let Jeff comment after I say this on USADA's position on that provision and that clause. It's a case-by-case -case basis depending on the circumstances, right? So what you've seen in the past is you've seen athletes that, again, have a rough fight. You know, they're super emotional. You've heard Dana talk about why you don't, he doesn't like when even Cormier or Rogan and, you know, speak to a guy after he's just lost a title fight. And athletes and fighters do emotional things in the moment. And part of the logic in doing that program is when you have an athlete who good faith retires, let's say the scenario of the athlete comes in and says, you know, tough bout, terribly disappointed. You can't even talk to the guy. And he, I'm done. I'm never doing this again. And, you know, retires. And then four weeks later, he comes back and he's like, eh, I was in the gym. I feel pretty good. I'm ready to come back. And it was designed to sort of remedy that situation where, it addresses that. Now you have an athlete that steps out of the program for a year, year and a half, two years, it starts to become a different, it's a different analysis and it's a different conversation. So it, it's a case by case basis, Kevin, and, and that's why that flexibility exists. 
we have the ability to do it and we use our discretion when it would make sense under the circumstances. But there's not a hard and fast line of when it would happen. But, but part of, and, I, and I'll get back to this too, part of why we think that the program will be so much better, and, and I've had conversations with a lot of you in the rooms over the years when we've had these issues, is the common sense approach to these conversations. You can sit down and have a common sense conversation with a lot of guys and make a determination about where you're at. And there's other guys that you wouldn't do it. And, and listen, you know, I know going forward, and I truly believe going forward, we are going to be so much better off. And again, I, I, I'm excited to sit here a year from now with Jeff and do a recap of just how far this program has come. You mentioned some of the feedback that the fighters have given you guys over time. Are you guys inquiring to the fighters for some input on how the structure should get laid out? I talk, myself and Donna, talk to fighters and managers every single day. And I'm not exaggerating. Saturdays, Sundays, that's what we've done over the last eight, nine years of this program. If you look at the changes that we made in this program over those eight or nine years, I could virtually trace every single one of those to suggestions, input from our fighters. We will always listen to our fighters. As, Hunt, as Hunter mentioned, you know, we had talked about me potentially separating from the UFC and being the independent administrator. I, like Hunter, didn't want to give this up. I, I love our fighters. I love interacting with them. I love being in a position where I'm hopefully helping their careers be longer, safer, um, more fruitful. Um, and so, I mean, we, we take input from our fighters virtually every single day, and that's not going to stop. And it sounds like the, te the technology itself, it itself is leaps and bounds ahead of what was already there. So to put like a timeline on it, would you say that this move away from USAD has been at least six months in the works, five, six months in, in, in the works? It, yeah, it's been a year. It's been a year. And, and, uh, and like most things, it started with a conversation. And it starts with the examples of frustrations that, again, aren't getting fixed. So when Dana sends me a text and Dana says, I just got a text from this athlete. They just showed up. Again, the common sense one, right? You haven't had fluid in your body for probably 30 hours. You're wrapped in towels coming out of a bathtub. And a guy shows up and says, I need your arm right now. You can wait 90 minutes. You'll be fine. Nothing's going to happen between now and then. Sit in the room, hang out, recognize what's going on, and then do the right thing. This isn't complicated, right? So all these things that happen lead to conversations where we start doing this. And I've had incredible frustrations over the years with Jeff. And, and I'll tell you, if you look at what's happened with the contaminated supplement issues, USADA had a very hard line how they approached that. And now we have thresholds adopted in California, I know we're working on finalizing them in Nevada. I can't tell you the resistance we have from USADA initially when this sort of happened. And so when I, listen, you know how crazy Nate Diaz is, right? Guy is out of his fucking mind, okay? But is there anybody in this room that thinks Nate Diaz intentionally is using performance enhancing drugs? Like, does anybody really believe that guy's doing it? This guy took a multi-vegan vitamin that some moron that he had working with him created, blah, 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 using whatever. He had picograms of whatever in his system, and it jeopardizes a fight for a guy whose entire career has been about calling everybody else a steroid user, and he's the only clean guy, and I run triathlons and look at him, and all of those things, right, would not have been situations that we could have fixed but for us forcing and pushing and fighting to get them to get them changed. And now they're out there using those as talking points for why they're sophisticated. But those talking points started with us. And, and my point is, is, you know, you hear Rogan talk about this the other day, and I know Travis referenced this as well. One of the things that I think we are required to do as administrators of this program, and in fairness to our athletes, is to continue to follow the science. Everyone hated stem cells. Stem cells were this illegal thing, X, Y, and Z. Well, we got athletes all over the world, and stem cells are now generally accepted everywhere in the world, including the United States, in a different form than they are in other places. But if you talk to athletes who use them, you talk to people, sophisticated, brilliant fucking guys, they'll tell you they changed their life for the better. 
So I'm going to deprive our athletes of an ability to prolong their careers because USADA is not ready to deal with WADA on an international level over some of this stuff. The answer is part of the ability for us in this new program is also to be able to do the testing, do the science, beta test out some of these things and establish if there's opportunities for us to allow athletes to do things that are progressive, that don't provide any performance enhancing advantage, that we clear with the commissions, that make them healthier and prolong their careers. It's a huge component and I'm tired of them telling us no, 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 fighting for nine months a year from now saying, okay, fine. And then three months later, I see them on TV talking about, we're progressive and now we're okay with this. And no, stop. Last, will all the current USADA suspensions be honored throughout the end of this, of the program? Yes. Thanks guys. I just want to just bring up real quick one thing that Hunter and I had talked about earlier, and this kind of goes to, you know, Hunter saying that the, the pressures that, you know, USADA is under, and I, along with Hunter, am sympathetic to that. They operate in this geopolitical environment where they're under the umbrella of WADA. Um, if they, you know, do things contrary to what, what WADA says, they have, you know, potential of losing that accreditation, and they can get suspended, and, and that's difficult. But when you see some of these cases and outcomes in the Olympic WADA world that USADA is adjudicating, they are really bad cases. And many of our athletes can't differentiate between, oh, that's a UFC USADA decision or USADA Olympic decision. Do yourself a favor and go look up a recent case on a US Paralympic cycling athlete, Katarina Brim. She is a diabetic takes insulin to survive and to live. And she forgot, because it's a daily part of her routine life, she forgot to declare that initially on her entry. She eventually did declare it. She never tests positive for it. Um, it wasn't ever found actually in her system, even though she admitted to use. And USADA suspended her for a year, a year. A Paralympic diabetic using insulin to live was suspended for a year for forgetting to put something on a form. And look, you know, USADA's position is, hey, if we didn't do this, we gave her the minimum possible. If we didn't do this, WADA would have appealed it. We didn't want her to get more. And I understand that. That's the world that we live in, that they live in. But that's a perfect example of why that world doesn't necessarily fit the professional sport model, the UFC model. I have a hard time associating with an entity that's giving out year sanctions to a Paralympian diabetic, notwithstanding what the circumstances are behind that of why they had had to do that. Jeff, that I have two questions, but that raised a question, so I'm going to ask that first in response to that. I remember back when Nevada first put drug testing in, and I was at a hearing in front of the Nevada Athletic Commission with uh, Fernando Vargas, the boxer, and he said that uh, his nutritionist put something in his food, and that's why he tested positive. Uh, I remember Dr. Flip Hamansky at that point made the point to him, you are the captain of the ship, and if you have something like that in your body, whether it came from somebody on your team or you intentionally put it in your food to, to gain an advantage, that you're up to the same penalty. Now, I understand Katarina thinks that issue and that's different, but how do you respond to those kind of instances if some fighter takes something and then, you know, he finds out later it's, it's different? I think the landscape has changed since then, and science has gotten better, and certainly as we communicate with Dr. Eichner, there are things that you could look at to tell out whether or not an athlete is telling the truth, and most notably in our program, it's testing data. That's why you know, we tell our athletes that, look, if you're not doing anything wrong or on purpose, more testing is your friend. It has much of a tendency to get you out of trouble than get you in trouble. And let me give an example of, of where we're at currently. There are, in the Olympic world now, documented instances of sex contamination cases. So female athletes subject to an anti-doping program like ours that have had unprotected sex with a male partner who is not an athlete that was using a prohibited substance that can pass through to the female. So you tell me, that's where we're at now in terms of the level of sensitivity. And if you don't address this issue of how sensitive these laboratories have become, 
you are going to spend your wheel, spinning your wheels, you know, spending time on athletes who the purpose of this program was not made for innocent athletes, innocent contaminant athletes. And that's a very, that's as important in a program to deal with as creating a program with no loopholes, in my opinion, these days, because Don and I spend more than half of our time working with athletes that the facts tend to indicate are not intentionally trying to cheat, nor did they get a performance advantage. And as Hunter said, we made some real progressive changes in the program along those lines, but they fought us tooth and nail for every single one of those before getting out publicly and saying, hey, look what we're doing. WADA, follow our lead. Well, it was our lead. We, we literally had an athlete that that actually we're fairly certain happened to. And, and I'm not even kidding. Jeff and I are in my office going through it and we start kicking around possibilities because I told Jeff, I just met with this, this athlete for two hours. You know, your judge, nobody's judgment's 100%, but I'd bet my life right now she's telling me the truth, right? So you start getting into what are the possibilities. And to answer your question, Kevin, I think that as the future of anti-doping moves forward, particularly on the commission side, and this is the next step of where we're trying to lobby and what we're trying to work for is back to the common sense approach. And I think there are two fundamental questions if you're a commission or an anti-doping body and you're trying to work in the sport you have to answer. The first is, what was the intent so did you intend to gain a performance enhancing, you know, a, a performance enhancing advantage? Did you intend to do something knowingly that you knew you shouldn't have? And then the second component is what is the ultimate benefit and did you even receive it? So you get an athlete who, again, I had an athlete who was a smaller guy in a smaller weight class whose wife purchased a daily multivitamin for women because his weight fit the women's daily multivitamin instead of the men's. It was vegan and it was NSF certified, not for clean sport, but some other vegan certification. So this guy literally sees it, sees NSF, doesn't realize there's a distinction between NSF clean and NSF vegan organic or whatever the hell that was. <laughs> Takes it and tests positive. No performance enhancing advantage, no intent. In my view, that's a no sanction. Why would you sanction that athlete for anything? right? It's stuff like that that I think changed a lot when the technology allowed these labs to start testing down to peak gram levels, right? When it was limited to a gram and some of this stuff, you, you, could, you could sort of operate a little bit differently. In today's world, I think it's very, very different. Speaking of picograms, that brings me to my last question. And John Jones seems to be the guy that has taken the brunt of the heat from the public for uh, what's happened. And I know we spent hours talking about this, you know, a few years ago. But does any of the technology that has been since developed then um, give John, you know, any more reason, you know, to say, hey, I'm innocent here and, and what's going on? Still looking for an answer on the M3 metabolite issue. And I forget who I was talking to recently, but we have an athlete, not John Jones. And I know all this attention goes to John and he's the poster boy and whatever, but we have a UFC athlete that has seen M3 metabolite come and go in his system for six years, six years documented of coming and going. So that right with no evidence of readministration of re-exposure. And again, going back to a few years ago, M3 metabolite, if you use this parent compound, you're gonna see a progression of parent compound, short-term metabolite, mid-term metabolite. All you ever see is the long-term metabolite. And what Dr. Eichner's told us is that means no new administration, no new exposure. It's just got a weird property where your body never breaks it down. So however, in your lifetime, you were exposed to this compound and it was in a lot of supplements back in the day, you might ride with it forever. And so I, I think it's, it's really unfair and what unfortunate, you know, the, the situations that John went through and, and both of them, under this program at least, neither of them had any evidence of intentional use. You know, the first one was a contaminated pill and then the second one was this crazy, wacky M3 metabolite issue, which he's not alone. He's not alone in the UFC. He's not alone in professional sports. It is all over the landscape and every sport imaginable and no one can find an answer to it. And, and I'll give you one of my favorite stories. I mean, this, this just shows you how crazy this world is. So 
there was a study done, and, and I'm going to mess up the time frame, and Dr. Eichner could probably speak far more articulately on it than I could, but here's, here's the short version. Clomiphene. They did a clomiphene study where they put random people coming in and they put them on a clomiphene dose to gain testosterone level increases, what the performance enhancing advantage was, et cetera. They tested it. They put them in it a couple months, however long they did it for. They tracked these athletes to see over time how their performance decreased. And in doing so, they sort of were able to track what the levels were over time. So for an extended period of time, the scientific community's opinion on clomiphene was, yeah, basically clears your system, let's say, between, you know, after you discontinue use, call it six months and maybe eight months, you know, six months, eight months, 10 months, a year, maybe at most. Whatever. That was the general opinion. So fast forward, I think a year or two later, they do another study unrelated. A significant portion of the people involved in the second study years later were people that were involved in the first clomiphene study. They bring them back in and they find that now they're retesting positive for clomiphene. They haven't used in two fucking years. I mean, these are the things that happen every day. And so when we're in these worlds and I have an athlete coming in and talking to me or talking to Jeff and saying, I swear to you on my life, I never did this. I never, I never did anything wrong. I've done everything right. I've done, what am I supposed to tell that kid? Are you gaining an advantage? So I have to, I, we have to do this and we have to be responsive to it. I mean, to not do it is completely irresponsible. And th th this is my example. If that happens and I have a guy like Dan Eichner, whose integrity you cannot question, who knows more about this world than maybe anybody on earth is telling you, you will not believe what I can now show happened. And they don't want to listen to it. And they're like, eh, that's complicated. That might open up a can of worms. We got a lot of precedent out there with some other athletes where this happened. And no, that's not right. You want me to tell an athlete, sorry, your career is on hold for two years because they got some precedent issues they're going to work through. They'll get back to you. No, I'm not doing that anymore. We have some journalists that have called in. Aaron Bronsitter, please go ahead. Hey guys, thank you so much for doing this and, uh, and clearing the air on a lot of different things. So, uh, first question for you guys, uh, and for Jeff, I guess. When you look at, um, I guess, uh, Drug Free Sport International, they're a for-profit versus USADA being a not-for-profit. Can you walk me through the difference uh, of what that means and how are they going to decide who is tested and when? Can you just repeat that one more time, the last part? Yeah, sure. Uh, the last part was, how are Drug Free Sport International going to decide who is tested and when? Yeah, I'll get it. The question, Aaron, sorry, it's, it's a little weird to hear you in here. The question was, how is Drug Free Sport going to determine who is tested and when? Is that correct? Yeah, and what's the difference between them being a for-profit company versus... You saw that being a not-for-profit. So, so on the for-profit side, I'll let Jeff get into that. The, the way that this program was designed and set up is essentially this. George is going to be the person that's going to determine who gets tested with what frequency when. That's completely in his control. We have no control over that. He'll work in coordination with Drug Free Sport, who will go out there and do the athlete collections. He'll monitor it. He'll make sure... Again, the requirements that we set forth for Drug Free Sport and the group in rebuilding the program were twofold. I mean, th these were my major points. I want to increase testing. I want to increase the types of tests used that will allow athletes and commissions to better make determinations on things distinguishing time frames for out of competition and in competition use. And I want to make sure that the substances that you're most likely to use to gain a performance enhancing advantage in the sport are tested at a level that are greater. And I literally said greater than every other professional sport in the world. You know, Jeff can speak to this too, Aaron. We, we, we spoke to USADA, and I think Jeff has multiple conversations where we tried to ask exactly, how often are you testing for EPO? How often are you testing for this? And there was never a direct answer. We never had transparency. One of the things now that George will be able to do is when we say, listen, are we fulfilling our obligations to test for EPO at a higher rate than every other professional sport in the world? He will say yes, and he will be in charge of making sure that that's done with drug-free sport. We have no involvement in it. But they answer to him. And really on the for-profit, not-for-profit, you know, what really what our concern is, is that 
drug-free sport has the ability to go anywhere in the world, collect from our athletes, and also maybe more importantly, is their flexibility. They listen to their clients. So when it comes to collections, they're going to adhere to a very rigid set of standards that we've created so that athletes still are not noticed before the testing, have a limited amount of time once that notification has been made. For instance, if the athlete's not home, a phone call is made to that athlete and or their manager, and the one hour clock starts ticking. Um, so again, the feedback that we've gotten from other sports is this is an entity that listens to their clients, that collects samples, how the clients want the samples. And as Hunter said, George is gonna be the guy telling them, hey, here's who I want samples collected, here's who I want them from, here's what time I want them from. Dr. Eicher will also do some of that based on the results that he's analyzing and seeing. So it is going to be smarter, more efficient sample collection and testing distribution planning of, of our athletes. Yesterday was, I think they were referring to Joe Rogan about injury recovery for athletes. Like if an athlete suffers a catastrophic injury, should they be allowed to use different substances that will allow them to heal faster? I mean, these athletes make their money when they show up to a fight to compete. So will this new program be making any sort of accommodations for athletes that do, you know, hope to use some sort of substances that will help speed up their injury recovery? Yeah, I understand the question. The, the answer is this is all a work in progress. I, I'll tell you this. When we roll out this program and start integrating it, there are going to be no short-term changes materially that do this. I think that one of the things, as I sort of expressed earlier, is, and, and Joe Rogan is 100%, I think, dead on accurate on this point. Just like I mentioned with stem cells, we're not going to allow anything to happen independently. An athlete would have to file a TUE. An athlete would have to submit that TUE to George. George will have an entire committee of scientific experts. He'll work with Eichner. He'll work with people who are specific experts within the individual field within which an athlete is requesting a TUE and an analysis will be made. Do I believe that over the next, call it five years of the program, we will be open to learning and open to seeing the science on some of these things and whether or not there's a performance enhancing benefit to the athlete from a performance perspective versus a recovery perspective, the answer is gonna be yes, we're open to it. Is the change immediate? The answer is no. And the honest answer why is, we haven't even rolled out this program. This is gonna take time. But I think that to just dismiss that as, as something where you say that's not even a possibility and we don't wanna hear it, that's the same mentality that we dealt with on the contaminated supplements and all the other stuff. So I think there's gonna be an openness to seeing what the science suggests. Nothing is gonna be rolled out starting, you know, part, like the, the, in, the implication that this was a part of the reason why we're moving off of USADA because starting on January 1st, you can use every steroid on earth and then come back a week later and that's all bullshit. That's not gonna happen. We're gonna do this thoughtfully, just like we've done everything else. We're gonna work with the best scientists in the world. And again, and I say this because it frustrates the hell out of me, we answer to athletic commissions. I need to make sure that before anything is done in our program, the buy-in is with the athletic commissions that are gonna license these athletes. But I do not wanna just say, we are not gonna be open-minded and progressive. If there is, for example, some peptide that seven months from now turns out, I mean, Jeff and I were talking, I think the FDA is now even starting to look at the effectiveness of some of these things for recovery. I'm not gonna tell an athlete, hey, no, you can't use this if there's scientific evidence that it helps with recovery, doesn't provide any performance enhancing benefit, allows you to recover from an injury faster, and you know it, it's helpful to you. That's no different than the way a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs have worked over time, but you have to have an openness to it. Yeah, let me just piggyback on that. No imminent changes, but we're not burying our head in the sand when it comes to these issues. So take, for instance, that you have world-class surgeons and physicians saying, look, when my next door neighbor or my wife or my kid has this injury, you know, in the initial healing stages of this injury, I'm giving them these prohibited substances to help them heal. And then we're looking at a scenario where you're gonna withhold that from a high level athlete who needs to be healthy and compete. Now on the other side, the reason there's no imminent changes, as Hunter said, it's a slippery slope. 
You know, you're, we're not just dealing with our rules, we're dealing with commission rules. And as we all see, saw from the TRT era many years ago, it's difficult. There's loopholes built into that. But, you know, I think what, what Joe Rogan was saying is what we're saying is we're not going to ignore it. We're not going to bury our heads in the sand. We're going to keep pressing forward, seeing if there are solutions there, um, and, and getting through that and not ignoring that topic. And I think what's ridiculous is like this narrative that it's like this wild west that we're going to reenter. The TRT days of athletes getting TRT exemptions and fighting and doing, the, we're so far beyond that. That's never what's going to happen. I mean, I think the scenario that you see, and I know Mark Cuban for a while was talking about it in the NBA where these guys completely blow out their legs or the Paul George situation. If there's something that's done for 10 days under the supervision of the best surgeon in the world at UCLA who feels strongly that this is the path and the athlete's out for a year, my question is, does he gain any performance enhancing benefit by the time he returns to competition? And if the answer is no, and he doesn't retain any, it helped him recover faster, I'm open to that conversation with the best experts in the world. To just blanketly say absolutely not, that's ignorant. So, but again, there are no changes imminent as it concerns that front. And one thing that a lot of the athletes have complained about is kind of draconian practices like their whereabouts and having to fill those in and then getting penalized if they don't fill in their whereabouts. I imagine that this new technology you're going to be using, you're probably going to have a more intuitive system. But, uh, and the other thing about that is, testers showing up and then having to use the bathroom in front of testers and shower in front of testers. A lot of weird stories I've heard over the years of that. Are we going to see any changes on that front in terms of athlete privacy? I think you're going to see some changes, but I don't think they're going to be material on some of the privacy components. And I'll tell you why. Because part of making sure you maintain the integrity of the program is also ensuring that the athlete isn't cheating. And I will tell you definitively, and I know a few that have done it pre USADA error, they were using, you know, fake genital devices that they filled with urine that wasn't theirs, and there's a lot of stuff that goes in there. My beef with the privacy component is not significant. I actually think that is part of their job to ensure that there's a fair playing field and they're doing what is required in almost every anti-doping program uh, around the world. So from that perspective, I, I, don't, I don't see there being a material change, and I'll let Jeff sort of speak to the other component. Yeah, but you know, to make it easier, I mentioned this earlier. Right off the bat, new technology will be launched, which I'd call much more simplistic, easier to navigate through. However, we've got long-term plans. And when I say long-term, you know, 12, 18 months out, once we get this new program up and launch, and the, we're calling it stopgap technology is up and working, we're working on the platinum standard technology that's going to involve geofencing. So basically, an athlete will have an app. They've recorded that they're in Las Vegas. When they land in Los Angeles, they get a push notification, bells and alarms on their phone saying, hey, you said you're in Vegas, you're in LA, you want to update? Push this button right here. Boom, they push the button and they're updated. Those are the types of things that USADA should have been doing over the last four or five years to develop. You know, they've told us many times, it's close, we've got it, we haven't seen a damn thing. Um, so let's see, are they going to launch, you know, launch this right after we have this conversation here? Maybe that wouldn't surprise me, but that's definitely, you know, what our end goal is to get this platinum standard technology to make the use for the athletes as easy as possible. Cause the burden that they carry under this program is significant. And the other part of that component too, is when you talk about things like the cost and how much money we spend and all that sort of stuff. I mean, these are the areas where. I, I'm more than willing to invest millions of dollars because this is a technology that I see us using until the end of time, right? And, and frankly, we can afford to go out there and pay the best programmers on earth to try to build this out over the next year. It, it has been, again, one of my frustrations, and we talked about it earlier, is this to me I know is more complicated than it sounds, but the movement just hasn't occurred. And so there will be a transition period we're trying to work through it now. We're not, we are not gonna have that day one the new program launches, but I can assure you, I have the best, smartest humans on earth working on this right now to make sure that in short order, and ideally, hopefully within the first year of the program or at a minimum in the start of the second year, we have, a, we have this developed in a way where the athlete will have an ability to use this as a resource should they choose to do so. And final question for me. Thank you so much for answering so many of these questions. The uh, USADA 
would roughly every week update their database as to who was being tested, how many samples they were providing. Will that same database exist under this new program? Yes. So actually, I think with more frequency and more accuracy, you know, we've actually internally, Don and I kind of watchdogs and, and policing things as we did. And, and thank goodness we've had the ability in the department to do that over the last several years. Or this program would be nowhere near as successful if they were left to their own. But, you know, we've seen some inaccuracies here and there. So the answer to that is yes, that will be more accurate and more frequent. And we think that's really important for competitors, fans, public to see that we're just not talking bullshit up here. These athletes really are being tested. And if you're interested, you can see how often and when they're being tested. Next set of questions will come from John Morgan. John, please go ahead. Yeah, guys, just two quick ones for me. First, I did want to ask you about cost. You may not know exactly yet, but is there a cost analysis on what this new program will cost versus the investment you were spending with USADA? No, and I'll tell you why. Because as of right now, I have a rough understanding of, I think, the proposal that USADA put in front of me. And I have a rough understanding of, I think, what it's going to cost to sort of begin to integrate into the new program. Here are the costs that I'm uncertain of at this point. I don't know how much money I'm ultimately going to have to spend to build out this technology the way that I think it needs to be built out. I'm in the process right now of already expanding Jeff and Donna's whole division. We're going to have multiple new employees full time that are going to be helping with the athlete relations components of this. We're going to be allowing, and this is going to come from George and from Dan, but you know, you guys sort of know our mentality and my mentality and Dana's mentality. It's like, I don't give a shit what it costs. Get the best in the world to help us with TUEs. Get the best in the world to help us with understanding the science. I don't care. Get the best so we get it right. And my position is in the end by doing so, we will run a more efficient program, which I think ultimately will be more cost effective. But you run a cost effective program by not wasting fucking time, by not doing it correctly. You do it correctly the first time, you invest up front, and then I think you get the financial benefit towards the end. So listen, I, and again, I know that this is all happening quickly. That truthfully is the absolute last thing in the world I worry about. I mean, like I said, you guys have all been to, you were at the press conference last weekend with Dana. Hey Dana, yeah, the sphere, great. Yeah, I don't care. I'm gonna probably lose a shitload of money, but it's gonna be cool. Okay, great. You know what I mean? Is it the best? That's all I give a shit about. So the costs will work themselves out. If it's the best, we're going to be in a good spot. That's all I care about. Nice. And last thing for me, I want to ask is, and ask this with the utmost respect, given his reputation, but Mr. Pirro, is there a mechanism in place just to ensure that transparency does remain, that independence does remain? I mean, obviously, money, power, things change sometimes, right? I mean, is, is there a mechanism in place to ma maintain that? At the end of the day, the answer is you do the best you can to put a person in that position that has a track record of showing a level of integrity that's almost unprecedented. So when Jeff came to me and he and I were working through this and literally I couldn't sleep, I was so worried about losing Jeff. He and Donna have done such an incredible job of, of building and maintaining and running this program. And I can't even express enough how incredible it was. It's just I had a really difficult time trying to identify anybody who I thought had his level of integrity, credibility, and respect. So when he comes to me and he tells me this is the guy, listen, anything's possible. Uh, I would be stunned if there is ever an issue with this human and his integrity. I guess the short answer also is at the end of the day, this is our program. And if there's ever a situation where, you know, listen, something catastrophic happened to the guy, you know, he became disabled, you know, died in a plane crash. We have the ability to, to, to put someone new in that role if that's the case. And if there was a level of unethical behavior from any party involved, we would have the ability to immediately transition to someone else. But again, I think that's about as far-fetched a likelihood as I can envision with the people we have involved. I can guarantee you the integrity and the standards that George are bringing to the table are unprecedented. And go do your homework on George Pira. We'll bring him in front of you guys soon, but when you start learning about who he is and what he's done and what he's been, to even think that he would go against the principles and values that we're talking about up here and make decisions for financial reasons or business purposes, if you haven't done your homework on George Pirro. Thanks, guys. Last set of questions will come from Damon Martin. Damon, please go ahead. 
Hey guys, thanks for doing this. Um, let me circle all the way back, and I apologize to the original USADA statement, and this might be a question best for Hunter. Um, so just to be clear, there was never a debate about Conor McGregor undergoing six months of testing. That was never part of the conversation. So based on that timeline, like Conor's timeline is still going to be eligible as of April 8th, 2024. That, that, that's correct. I'm correct about that, right? It sounds close to me. And yes, to answer your question, and I'll, I'll take it a step, a step farther. Not only was there never a question as to the time frame. It was represented affirmatively on multiple occasions over the course of multiple months that there was never even a consideration on our part to waive the six month requirement. And if you talk to Connor's management, which feel free to do, they are well aware, his lawyers, his management, everybody, they were well aware that that was always the position, always. So that, that's why that whole, again, that's why when you ask me those questions about that narrative being used, it's just, it's so disappointing and frustrating. Could, could not be, could, it's dangerously close to not being misleading. It's dangerously close to being a complete intentional misrepresentation, which I would never want to think Travis would actually do. So a quick follow-up to that, maybe I'm reading too much into the statement, and this is specifically for you, Hunter, on a legal side. You said there could be legality here. In their statement, they specifically said, uh, you know, we do not allow fighters without an approved medical basis to use performance-enhancing drugs like experimental, unapproved peptides or testosterone for healing or injuries. And it seemed like they're just simply targeting Connor with that statement and almost outing him like he cheated by using those specific things. Am I am I reading too much into that or is that part of the legality we're talking about? Because I saw that statement. I said, it seems like they're just basically trying to out Connor for what he supposedly did or didn't do. I think they need to be very, very, very fucking careful with how they articulate those communications. You know, like I said at the beginning. One of the things that we've always valued in this program is the level of integrity and trust that the athletes have to have when they deal with an entity like this. And I cannot speak, nor can Jeff, nor can anybody speak for Connor. Only Connor can speak for Connor. But I'll tell you this, in the entire time I've dealt with him from the time he was injured until literally I've talked to him about, you know, via text and phone calls and everything. I can't tell you how frequently over the last few hours, few days, you know, he's, 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 fucking devastated man he's frustrated he's devastated you know he feels like as a guy who was the most tested athlete in the history of the program as a guy who and I was there the three of us were on the call who made it very clear to Travis he has always been obsessed with a fair playing field he's always been obsessed with integrity and he was always been obsessed with doing the right thing and being honest and transparent. And I feel like he believes he's done all that. Now he can, Connor is the only person that can speak for him. I have no idea what USADA is doing, but I'll tell you this. It concerns me the way that they tried to represent how this partnership is coming to an end at the end of the year. So I can speak to the way I feel about that component. And I feel like that was materially misrepresented. And I will say this again, I feel like using him as a vehicle where they put out a press release saying he's re-entered the pool when I don't even know how many athletes have re-entered a pool or come into a pool and they've never done that. Yeah, I think it's very concerning. So I guess that's a question, you know, for them, but I know that this program is big on trust and responsibility and maintaining confidentiality with the athletes. So that's really something for those guys, but I can only speak to my dealings with Connor and he had like, he literally could not be more professional, could not be better. And again, even with all the things that they've done, he reentered the pool and he did it before the USADA even knew that I wasn't going to renew the program at the end of the year, you know? So it's all very strange guys. It's really strange. He's fulfilled every obligation under the rules that has been asked of him and gets rewarded and again, with that, with that garbage statement that came out earlier this week, really unfair. And they put that statement out. I mean, listen, and Jeff, Jeff can give you the timeline of this. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but you know, they had an onboarding call of some kind, whether it was education or whatever set up. And it sounded like they tried to move the call. And I think Donna, who was working with them on our side, was like, listen, he's, a, he's not the easiest guy to get a hold of. Connor got a lot going on in his life. So 
you know, he's dealing with his family and I, I, I think he's publicly said his wife's expecting and, you know, he's focused on his family. The guy, the guy does a lot of stuff and, you know, we made him available. He made himself available. He, he did everything he was asked to do and they tried to move the call. And Donna was like, yeah, you're not moving the call. We've set this, we have this guy. I think he's on a boat somewhere in the fucking Mediterranean. I don't know what the hell he's doing. Um, you know, but he's, he's, he's living his life makes himself available, does it, and apparently, from what I understand, literally within five minutes of him hanging up the onboarding call, they released the statement, which means they had already had it pre-drafted, which means it was premeditated. It's just, listen, it's just not, it's not the way we do business. And it's not the way Jeff has conducted himself. It's not the way we've built the culture of the program. It's not the way, it's not the way I do business with partners at this level when you've spent millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. You know, if I was somebody in the future that was looking at getting in business with USADA, it would concern me the way that this relationship has come to an end. It's very disappointing. And one real quick follow up to Jeff. Uh, when you guys launched the anti-doping program with USADA, you guys sent out the UFC anti-doping program policy guide. And it's still publicly available to this day, even the tweaks and everything. Um, when the new program starts as of January 1st, is that is that policy staying the same for now and then tweaks will be made later in terms of every rule, every, you know, guideline that is still in there right now, that'll just carry over until you make tweaks? Yeah, we're, we're taking a deep dive into it now, but as Hunter mentioned earlier, we don't anticipate any substantial changes to it. And yes, that actually, even if there are changes to it, that will be posted in advance of January 1st. So again, the transparency of this program will continue. Anyone who wants to read what every single rule is that our athletes have to adhere to will have the ability to do that on a public facing website. I'll tell you one rule that's going away to the minute we put the program in place is this substantial assistance, whatever the hell that thing was. That, that was a nightmare. So yeah, there's gonna be some changes. But in terms of the material independence, transparency, everything that's really material to the integrity of the program, all of that is either remaining intact or actually getting increased. Again, not one step backwards. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for everything. I really Thank appreciate you, you coming.